listening to the Food Garden Life Show, the show that brings together gardening, food, and the human story. I'm your host, Emma Biggs. And I'm Stephen Biggs. We talk to creative food gardeners and farm and garden experts who break the rules and make new ones, too. For the past few years, Emma has squeezed 100-plus tomato varieties into our relatively small growing space by planting them close together and then training them upwards. She grows them as single stems, up twine that's suspended from a horizontal pole above. There are much easier ways to grow tomatoes, but by growing them upwards, growing them vertically, she can fit much more, much, much more into a small space. The term vertical gardening is often used to describe this type of gardening, where things are planted densely and growth is trained upwards. Today, I share tips for vertical gardening, top crops, how to do it, and what you can do to make your own trellises and structures inexpensively. What you'll hear today is from the live vertical gardening camp that fellow horticulturist Donna Balzer and I ran earlier this year. I wanted to jump into vertical gardening, which is our, our theme for tonight. And as I was thinking about vertical gardening, how I'd uh, come at this topic, I thought, well, let's just, we'll discuss what is, what does it mean, the concept. I'll share with you some examples that I've seen and liked of vertical gardening. I'd like to give you some ideas for the materials that you could use for vertical gardening and then finish off with some plants. And again, Donna and I don't choreograph what we're doing. So we're always hopeful that we'll come at this in completely different ways and, uh, and give you lots of different ideas to go home with. So the concept of vertical gardening, it's, it's just a fancy schmancy way of saying grow things upwards. And what we're trying to do is make the best use of space and use up all the light that we can because what a lot of people face in a backyard situation is not enough space to grow everything that we want. So all vertical gardening is saying is grow what we can upwards to harvest as much of that sunlight as we can and to squeeze more into a small space. But I did want to make the, the comment that it's nothing new, even though this term vertical gardening is a little bit trendy right now, there's nothing new about this at all. It's as old as the hills, and it can be as simple as staking a tomato plant, which you're causing to grow upwards when you stake it, as opposed to letting it sprawl on the ground. So, so that's what we mean when we talk about vertical gardening. And here's a picture for you. My neighbor, Joe, has a, a relatively small backyard by my neighborhood standards, but he has it full. And this is what it looks like. And so talking about vertical gardening, he has all of his tomatoes staked and fairly tightly spaced. And then what this picture doesn't show you too well uh, is that he has a wall of beans all around this yard. And it's eight to 10 feet high and it is it consists of wire mesh and stakes encircling his whole yard and it's full of beans and so when i go back there he sends me home with a full bag full of pole beans every time it is just packed full it's amazing what he gets out of this little space so this is a good example of vertical gardening and i guess what got me excited about this concept and this is me uh, a few moons ago in a, in a previous garden and one year my squash plants got away from me and they grew up my cedar hedge and uh, what happened was it was you can see that my squash leaves have some powdery mildew on that white color and so it was getting into August and I was thinking man they look ugly I think I'll rip them down and then I found that the cedar hedge was studded with squash and there were about a dozen squash studded in this hedge. So even though <clears throat> this was unintentional, even though it was a semi-shaded location, there were all these squash there. So that got me interested in this idea of vertical gardening. So I have 
examples for you. Here's what uh, my daughter Emma and I have been doing recently. And I think I've said that she is crazy about tomatoes. So we fit in, she fits in about a hundred tomato varieties into our backyard. There's never enough space for the number of tomatoes she wants to grow. So the challenge is how do we plant them as densely as possible? And what we decided to do was to do what commercial greenhouse growers do, which is to keep a tomato plant limited to a single stem and grow it up twine. So if you go to uh, Ontario has a big commercial tomato greenhouse industry. And if you go into a greenhouse, you'll see this twine coming down from above and they train a single stem up. So that's what we did here. And uh, so we created in this case, we used bamboo to create this framework. And, uh, but looking down to the ground, this is what it looks like. So the spacing on these tomato plants is less than a foot. We prune them to one stem and twist them around the twine. So that's a good example of vertical gardening. Is anybody in, if anybody in the group is doing anything like this, by the way, with your tomatoes, pop it into the chat. Great way to squeeze lots into a small space. Where I've been teaching at Durham College, they've been doing something similar and a um, little bit more industrial looking, but very, very practical. You can see they've built these permanent frames right into their raised beds. Vertical gardening could be something as simple as just making good use of your fence space. So here's a picture of a squash growing along a fence. Could be something like this, a watermelon in a sling. I have a picture coming up of the, the structure that this was growing in, but we think of watermelons as being heavy. So we think that we have to have them on the ground, but if you don't have a lot of space, you can just simply put a sling underneath to hold them up. And I think uh, an example of vertical gardening that a lot of people might have seen is it being done with beans, with pole beans and runner beans, because they're such great candidates for this. The, the bean plants aren't too heavy, so they're easy to support. You don't need a very elaborate framework to hold them up. And quite often people will create things out of bamboo or, or out of branches. And just check in the chat window. I see, um, Chet, that you're growing your tomatoes up a string. And, um, and Chet is the one, by the way, who put me on to a, or put Emma on to a really great idea with a little pulley so that uh, you can actually lower that tomato plant as it reaches the top of wherever your string is suspended from. If you have a little pulley on there, you can actually lower that tomato plant down and give it more space to grow upwards. Here's just another example of using some bamboo. And what I wanted to show here though, is that you can see that underneath are planted some crops. So at the sides will be planted something like peas or beans to grow up the bamboo but you can make use of this space underneath to grow crops that will be tolerant of that partial shade underneath. So that usually means some kind of leafy green. Now, I just wanna check the chat window here and see if I'm caught up. And uh, okay, I see a uh, mention of cattle fencing to make a tunnel between straw bales. And I haven't tried that. But yes, Joel Karsten has that in his book, and I love that idea. And I'm a big fan of the, uh, the, the cattle fencing. I see Ali's comment too, that trellis, trellis vine crops uh, trained to grow over the garden do double duty, providing shade for more sensitive crops in the summer months. That's such a great point because in the summer months, in the heat of summer, a lot of those leafy greens don't want to be in the full sun. It's just too hot. And when they are in the full sun, what do they do? But they, they bolt. They'll send up a flower shoot and then that's it. So that's a great point. I appreciate that. I see, okay, Chet uh, using electrical conduit. Excellent. And I have ideas coming up on materials we can use, but I didn't include electrical conduit in there. So that's a great one. And then 
David's asking the question, what is cattle fencing? It is a metal mesh, a, a metal mesh that's designed to be used as cattle fencing. But David, it's also really useful in creating structures for vertical gardening and, and trellises and that sort of thing. It's something you're more likely to find if you go to a farm co-op just on the outskirts of the city. Right in the city, you probably won't find it. Still continuing on with more ideas for you of ways to do vertical gardening. This caught my eye. You can see that they've used some old um, branches. This was at Upper Canada Village near Cornwall, Ontario. And if anybody's in Ontario and you like historical villages and you like gardens, this is a fun place to check out. They've got some really nice ones, but this one to me ties in a little bit of the ornamental with the, uh, the, the practical vertical gardening. The, the fun thing is with creating structures for vertical gardening, if you're wanting to add an ornamental accent to your garden, you can get creative and do things like you see in the picture here. They've had fun with the rope and they've used this really stout bamboo to give this a certain look. So if, if you're interested in the ornamental as well as the, uh, the, the actual harvest, there are ways to do that. I wanted to say too that uh, teepees out of bamboo are both practical, but if there's kids around your gardens, they can be fun. We've had a lot of fun doing bamboo teepees, making a little hideout inside. An A-frame is a very simple structure to create. And in this picture here, you can see the red circle just showing off the cucumber because it's quite hidden in this picture. But this ties into what Ali was pointing out earlier that when, when you're growing these vining crops, it creates this semi-shaded space that can be very useful for leafy greens and things that don't want the full sun. And so here we have the cucumbers above and leafy greens below. And then here's the, the classic example of vertical gardening is just the simple staking of a tomato plant. And if we look at this picture here, what I wanted to point out is that at the ground level, you can see there's a few parsley plants there but there's also still a lot of bare soil. So you can still plant more at the base of this plant. And contrast this to how a tomato would grow if you didn't do anything to it. And if anybody has seen field grown tomatoes, you'll know that they just sprawl all over the place and they take up a lot of space. So, so by putting in a simple stake and training it upwards, you free up all sorts of space on the ground. And on that note with tomatoes, as my tomatoes are growing and in the ground, I'll often seed lettuce at the base, which as the tomatoes get bigger, they'll, they'll give it some shade and that lettuce will perform better in the heat of the summer. So our vertical garden uh, technique could be something as simple as a trellis, a trellis on a wall, and we can have fun with arbors and pergolas. And I wanted to share with you an unexpected vertical gardening surprise. This was in my spruce tree in my front yard. And I was growing a trombetta summer squash in my front yard edible garden. And uh, I noticed that it had grown right inside the spruce tree. So when I went inside the spruce tree, and you can see it in the background in the picture here, there it was, this nice trombetta summer squash, which turned into this. So, I mean, this is the kind of thing a textbook isn't going to recommend because these are not perfect conditions. Nobody's going to purposely grow a squash on the inside of a spruce tree. But it's the kind of thing that when we're doing backyard gardening and we're looking for ways to squeeze more plants into a small space, Doing things like letting a vining squash plant grow amongst our trees, up our shrubs, is such a good way to make good use of space. Another accident. This was the year I had made a teepee for my painted lady runner beans. 
what happened was that they did so well in that spot that they grew up and above the teepee and into my matsu apple tree above. So you can see in the picture here that there's these nice green matsu apples and there's these nice bean flowers. And I liked the look of this so much that I tried to recreate it in subsequent years and I could never get it to look as nice as it did that first year that it happened by accident. But again, I'm just thinking about the vertical gardening. So growing beans up a teepee is one example, but then letting them grow even beyond that and into the, the shrubs or the trees around is just taking it a step further. Stephen, there was a question about the squash. What is okay. that squash's normal shape? Oh yes, okay, that is. So this is a fun one. I have another picture of this squash coming up, but this is called a uh, trombetta or I've seen it called tromboncino squash. I'm going to type that name into the chat window here. And the fun thing about this one is that it can be eaten as a summer squash or you can let the rind become more thick and then you can eat it as a winter squash. And when eaten as a winter squash, the uh, the flesh becomes a little bit more orangey and it's one that I've seen used sometimes to make if you've ever seen the squash filled ravioli apparently this is the squash that's often used to make that so it's a it's versatile in the kitchen and because of this vining growth habit it's also very well suited to any kind of vertical gardening technique coming up you can make your own trellises and structures, and I have ideas for materials that you can use. I also share a few of my favorite crop ideas. That's coming up in just a moment. A shout out today to Ken for sending a picture of a fig. Thank you, Ken. And a shout out to Brian, who shared a link for an article about the blue jay bean. And the blue jay bean is a variety that's been perpetuated by seed savers. The article that Brian shared is from the Globe and Mail, and it's all about seed saving and what home gardeners can do, but also why seed saving and perpetuating some of these varieties is important. For those of you interested in seed saving, Emma and I are big fans of an organization here in Canada called Seeds of Diversity, and it promotes the growing and saving of heirloom food crops. And we have some new inspiration for you on foodgardenlife.com, a new article about the winter hardiness of figs. Just how cold can your fig tree get over the winter and survive? we dig into winter hardiness. We also have a new article about how to keep your lettuce plants from bolting quickly in the heat of summer. And if you're enjoying today's topic, we also have an article about vertical gardening on foodgardenlife.com with tips, ideas, and inspiring pictures. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show, the show that brings together gardening, food, and the human story, with your hosts, Emma Biggs and me, Stephen Biggs. Now, back to our talk today about vertical gardening, and what you're hearing is from the live camp that we ran earlier this year, all about vertical gardening. Some thoughts for you on materials. First and foremost, sometimes we can do great things with what we've pruned in our own backyard. So when I prune my fruit trees, I can save the branches and these are great for growing peas and, and growing beans. And even better was when my former neighbor, Troy, used to have a mulberry tree because mulberry trees put on a phenomenal amount of growth in a year and it's nice and straight. So every time that he pruned this tree, he dropped these bundles of these nice straight branches over the fence for me. So just a, a thought. In fact, in the in the UK, there's this uh, a tradition of what they call coppicing, where they cut trees off at ground level 
to encourage them to sprout out with, with multiple branches. So this uh, coppicing technique is a good way, if, if one had the space, to produce some of your own material to use as stakes. But if not, something like a mulberry that puts on a lot of growth can be really useful for uh, creating staking material. And I mentioned earlier that uh, the idea of bamboo. So I've used bamboo extensively in my yard. I like the look of it. And here's Emma and me with an A-frame that we made. And what I wanted to point out here is that this is pretty easy to do. So what the, the bamboo at the edge of this wire, and this is that concrete reinforcing wire mesh that we've been talking about in the chat. The, the bamboo just prevents it from bending when it's stood upright like this. So I just have a bamboo piece on each side of it attached with a simple zip tie. So I just wanted to make the point that you can easily build some of your own structures for vertical gardening with zip ties, with some bamboo or some sticks, and a little bit of wire. And that's all that we've done here. And then the only other piece to this that you don't see in this picture is I put, I think, one stake into the ground and tied this A-frame to it in case there was a wind so that this wouldn't get tipped over. So quite simple to create. And I see uh, Ellen's asking about how many seasons you can get out of bamboo. I've been able to get a number of seasons out of it. Ellen, it'll depend if you're sinking it into the ground. So whatever portion you sink into the ground will rot away within a season. But in this case, this is just standing atop the ground and I just fasten it to a stake that's next to it. So when your bamboo is above ground, it'll go for quite a while. And let's see, I see um, Sharon, your comment that it, you have a neighbor in Toronto growing a tall patch of bamboo and uh, that you can source at home. Oh, so I planted bamboo this fall because I was interested in the idea of bamboo shoots in the kitchen and a visual screen at the back of my property. So bamboo can be broadly broken down into two types. There's clumping bamboo, which is well behaved, stays in a clump, and there's what's called running bamboo. And it really does that. It just takes off and will gallop into your neighbor's yard. So the one I planted is a running bamboo, which could be good because I should get lots of bamboo stakes, but it means I have to, I should put some kind of enclosure at the ground level around it or really be on top of preventing it from spreading too far. Another example of bamboo. So this is my son Keaton and he decided that he wanted a melon house. He loves growing melons. So we decided to make a bamboo structure up which he could grow his melon plants. And so here it is. And Although the melons did not do particularly well owing to the squirrel population around here, actually building this was a lot of fun. And we just made bamboo tripods on each of the corners, the four corners, just a tripod with three pieces of bamboo, and then used nice big stout long pieces of bamboo to span those. So this is a, an example of how you can build a short-term structure for vertical gardening. So imagine something like this with bamboo or with cucumbers or with bitter melon, some of these vining crops, a fun, a fun project for vertical gardening. If you're working with bamboo, I mentioned the idea of using zip ties. You can also use twine. Here's a couple different types of twine that are made from natural fibers. So there's sisal that's on the left, and there's jute, which is on the right. So those are both natural fibers, the kind of thing you can put in the compost pile at the end of the season. And the only thing to mention with these is that you don't want to try to use these for more than one season because they do actually break down. I see uh, in the chat window, uh, uh, Janice, your comment about stockings over the melons and that squirrels have a hard time with them. Thank you. Keaton and I were just discussing our melon strategies the other day, so I'll tell him that. That's a great idea. And I see, uh, Nick, you did something similar with bamboo, a bamboo room 
last year. Excellent, excellent. And then uh, Jeannie, you're wondering if the melons were growing in the bales. Yes, indeed. So I talked about the straw bale gardening last week, and that's what we were doing in this picture here is the bales were there to define this space because it was almost like a kid's room but also to make a growing space so they were serving two purposes so thanks for asking that i wanted to make the comment too just thinking about materials that you can use for vertical gardening uh, this little teepee right here i ran out of bamboo so i just on my table saw i just ripped some one by two lumber that i had lying around so you can be creative with materials. Uh, now here is the picture where, this is the spot where I took the picture of that watermelon in a sling. This, uh, if anybody knows Stokes Seed Company, this was their trial garden. And I was on a garden writer's tour there. And this is where the melons were. So I just wanted to share the idea of lattice being something you could use in your garden to create structures for vertical gardening a bit more expensive to work with than bamboo, a little bit longer lasting, but uh, depending on what you're after, it's another option you can think about. And then there's metal posts, and here's the mesh. So this is the mesh that's been coming up in the chat window, the kind of thing that is often used when people are uh, pouring concrete, and I've used it, I showed you with the bamboo how I use it, but I've also bent this Oh, and I used it here between my wicking beds. So you can see that uh, we made these uh, structures in between our wicking beds, up, up which we grew cucumbers and another vining crop called a chosha. And I have a picture of that one coming up. So this is one place where we've used that. But the other thing is we use the, uh, the wire mesh to make our bean wall. We grow runner beans and pole beans up this. And here you can see that uh, instead of bamboo, I'm just using some iron rebar. So this will rust and it will take on this patina of time. So it, uh, if, if that's a look that you don't mind, very practical because unlike the bamboo, which when it's in the soil rusts or rots out fairly quickly, this, this rebar lasts for a very long time. So for those looking for a longer lasting solution, I recommend that. And again, these are just held together with zip ties, so it's easy to do. This, by the way, uh, that bean wall was inspired by my neighbor, Joe, who I started out talking about when I first talked tonight about vertical gardening. He's the one with that yard that's enclosed with this wall of beans. So he inspired this. And here's another use for that wire for concrete is uh, sometimes I make tomato cages out of it if you bend it. I was one year trying to figure out a way to put a bamboo cross piece atop our metal posts and I was scouring the garage for supplies and I found some plumbing fittings and I thought that's it that's what I need to make these two pieces work together. So be creative there's lots of fun ways to make your structures for vertical gardening Let's finish off just with some ideas for you about plants. And I guess first and foremost would be squash, cucumber, melons, because they have tendrils that help them cling to and pull themselves up whatever structures we put there for them. And there's that one of those tendrils in this picture on the right. And then the second point here, this is that squash name that I typed earlier in the chat the tromboncino, and this is the one that you can grow as a winter squash or as a summer squash. It's really versatile. And the neat thing about this is it seems to be a bit less susceptible to bugs and disease. So if you've suffered from those in the past and you're put off of growing squash, I do recommend that you uh, try it. Now, one caveat is that some of the summer squash varieties don't have a vining growth habit. They're more bush-like. So if vertical gardening is your goal, just make sure to pick something that's that has a vining growth habit. Cucumelons, this has been a favorite in our household. Sometimes they go by the name mouse melon. 
I've seen them called Mexican sour gherkins. It's a, it's a relative of the cucumbers. They look like mini watermelons, but they taste like little cucumbers with a little hint of citrus. So uh, they're also a, a vining crop, so well suited to growing up and over trellises and teepees, etc. When it comes to using tomatoes in vertical gardening, the key point I want to make is just to pick what's called an indeterminate variety, a vining variety. If we were to really broadly break tomatoes into two camps, there would be the determinate, which get to a set height and stop growing, or the indeterminate, which keep growing upwards. So it's those indeterminate ones that we want if we want to grow tomatoes up high, indeterminate. Beans are great candidates for your vertical gardening projects, pole beans, runner beans, and peas. The point I'd like to make about peas is that some pea varieties are fairly short. They might get to about knee height and then stop growing. But if you hunt around, you'll see what's called vining pea varieties, which get taller. And so these are the ones that are, are well suited to vertical gardening purposes. And a variety that I've grown over the years that does this, it's called tall telephone. Now some ideas for lesser known plants that you might have fun using in your vertical gardens. This one is called a chosha. It makes these edible pods. I was really excited when I finally tracked down seeds for it until my neighbor Dave said to me, oh, back in Africa, we used to feed those to the cows. And I thought, oh, really? But what I, what I found with this is that if you leave those pods too long, then they do become fibrous. But if you pick them when they're really small, they're crunchy and a really nice thing to eat raw or to use in a stir fry. So it's a fun vining crop to work into a vertical garden, a chosha. This is the burgerkin that I started out the presentation with a picture of. Again, a vining crop, really well suited to vertical gardening. Is anybody here growing Malabar spinach? These ones, you can use the stem pieces and the leaves in stir fries. That's how I best like it. And if you like the idea of this, I want to point out one thing is that this one here has a red stem and red coloring in the leaves. So it makes it really highly ornamental as well as being edible. There's also a variety that's only green. So if you're going after this for the ornamental aspect too, look for the one that has red in it. Usually this, I've never seen transplants for sale. So if you like the idea of the Malabar spinach, you can just grow it from seed. Just buy the seed, it's easy to grow. And I see Sharon that you grow this too. So, okay, thanks for sharing. A lot of people think of loofah and loofah sponges. But if you pick these when they're small, you could use them in the same way that you would use a summer squash. So uh, a fun vining crop that you could work into your edible garden and you could either grow your own sponge or if you pick some of them small, use them in the same way that you would use a summer squash. And I mean, there's so many more things we could use. If we go beyond veggies and we think of fruits, uh, we could think about kiwi, we can think about grapes and blackberry, or if you're into making beer, you could think about hops. All of these have vining habits, making them suitable. And so my challenge is, as I finish up uh, here, I just wanted you to think about, I've got a picture here of a vertical feature made using willow. What could we do here to make this edible? Maybe you could, could you make this out of a non-living, make this arch out of something non-living, but then put a vine over top with beans or with summer squash or Mexican gherkins? How would you do this? What would you put here? How could you make an, an archway like this that was edible? Okay, Carolyn's suggesting uh, beta grape on the willow arch. Thank you. 
And the, the great thing about grape, of course, as well as fruit, you can use the grape leaves in the kitchen too. Make little dolmati rolls. And if it were me, I might just think about planting some loofah here. I think that could be really fun. This is at Toronto Spadina House, where they have this wall that has these containers filled with flowers. And I was thinking, boy, I mean, there's an opportunity for vertical gardening. Think of all the veggies that you could have on there. Think of the, the grapevine. Think of the kiwi vine. Think of the hot peppers that could be growing in these planters. As you're, as you're thinking about this idea of vertical gardening, take a look around at some of the things that we're doing for our ornamental gardens and see if you can plug in some edible plants. So that's the end of my formal presentation on vertical gardening. And let's just pause for a second. Did any ideas jump out for anybody? What jumped out for you? What might work in your situation? That was me talking about vertical gardening, a recording of one of the live online camps that we hosted earlier this year. What did you think? Any ideas or crops that jumped out at you? Let me know if they did. And if you want to dig deeper into this topic, there's an article about vertical gardening on foodgardenlife.com. The podcast is back next Thursday, but before that, don't forget that next week's show starts off Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern time as our live radio show on realityradio101.com. Join us live and you can send in your questions. And we have a great show lined up. Kim Stoddart joins us from the UK. She's the author of The Climate Change Garden. And Brad Lancaster joins us from Arizona to talk about harvesting rainwater and food forests. And Brad is the author of Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond. We'd love it if you drop by to say hi online at foodgardenlife.com. We have articles about growing fruit, veg, using your homegrown produce, also about growing figs and lemons in cold climates. So say hi. Tell us the topics that would help you grow more of your own. And you'll also get to see the faces that go with these voices that you hear on the podcast. While you're at foodgardenlife.com, also grab our free newsletter. Subscribers get the subscriber-only cold climate fig guide and small space food gardening tip sheet. And you can find me on my website, emmabiggs.ca, and on Instagram as emmabiggs underscore grows. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show. I'm Stephen Biggs. And I'm Emma Biggs. Thanks for tuning in. Mm -hmm.